Good morning and thank you for joining us on Africa This Morning. My name is Beryl Oro. Let's start the bulletin with a look at the top stories. I have confirmed that the oil are not from an aircraft. Malaysia Airlines mystery. With ships and aircrafts from 10 countries, the search enters its fourth day for the missing plane. Oscar Pistorius trial. Presiding a judge on the trial rules that pre-recorded package of the pathologist's testimony should be made available to the media. Digital Migration Survey Ipsos Sinovate gives a report indicating that Kenyans are not ready for the migration with failure to acquire the set-top boxes. Two men travelling on stolen passports on board the missing Malaysian airline plane were Iranians with no apparent links to terrorist groups. This emerged as authorities searching for the missing plane widened their search amid increasing frustration from the passengers' families. Search teams expanded their scope to the Straits of Malacca. A massive search and rescue operation enters its fourth day for a missing Malaysia Airlines jetliner. Ships and aircraft from 10 countries scour the waters off Malaysia and Vietnam, but none of the debris or oil slicks spotted earlier has proved to be linked to the disappearance. On the, on the oil slick that was uh, found by the Maritime uh, Enforcement Agency of Malaysia, uh, they, have, they have sent the samples to the chemistry department today and we have got the report uh, from the chemistry department of Malaysia is uh, to, they have they have reported that uh, they have confirmed that the oil are not from an aircraft. Malaysia's civil aviation chief says the search area has been doubled since flight MH370 vanished on Saturday, shortly after it left Kuala Lumpur. The focus has been on two passengers who boarded the flight using as, stolen as, European as passports. The pictures of those two passengers, we have looked. We have looked and re-looked at the footage of the video and, and the photograph. It is confirmed now that they are not Asian-looking male. As the search continues, investigators are looking at all angles, including a possible terror attack or hijacking, the fate of the Beijing-bound aircraft and the 239 people on board is still shrouded in mystery. The families of passengers on board the missing Malaysian airline jetliner are desperately waiting for news of their loved ones at a hotel in near Beijing airport. Here is more on that update. Families of passengers on board the missing Malaysia Airlines jetliner desperately await news of their loved ones at a hotel near a Beijing airport. Their frustration is growing after a massive sea and air search enters its fourth day with not a trace of the aircraft or the 239 people on board. The majority, 153 people on the flight, were Chinese citizens. Ms. Wang is the daughter of one of the missing passengers. For family members who lost contact with their relatives, the foremost concern is to find them, find out where they are and find out what happened. If there's no progress on search and rescue efforts, we hope they can increase efforts in investigating the possibility of hijacking. Flight MH370 bound for the Chinese capital vanished on Saturday shortly after it left Kuala Lumpur. Some family members are now traveling to Malaysia to wait for news. The wife, child and father of Malaysian passenger Mohamed Kairul Amri are waiting with other families in a hotel. For sure we hope to see him, whether he's alive and in good condition or whatever the outcome we accept. The wife of Prime Minister Najib Razak visited the hotel to offer some support. These families had hoped to welcome their relatives home, but now any glimmer of hope of seeing them alive is slowly fading. At least 15 people died yesterday morning after a matatu they were traveling in plunged into the valley along the Nandi Hills Chemilil Road in the Kenya Rift Valley. Police said the matatu was ferrying passengers from Eldoret when the accident occurred. Eyewitnesses say the driver of the 14-seater Matatu heading to Kisi from Eldoret lost control and plunged into the valley. Seven people died on the spot. Six others died while being taken to hospital, where two more died while receiving treatment at a local hospital. Five are still admitted in hospitals receiving treatment. 
Police said the 14-seater Matatu was ferrying passengers from Eldoret through Kapsabet to Kisi when the accident occurred. It was a, with excess. They had about 17 people, 14 at death, and three children. So uh, all human beings which were in that uh, vehicle were about uh, 20. So uh, the problem actually, I think we can also blame the, the traffic who were on the road. I think it is everybody's responsibility, including the passenger uh, themselves. Uh, a police officer cannot be everywhere, right? We all know the law. And uh, ignorance is not a defense. Uh, I think it is our responsibility, all of us, uh, to ensure that the vehicles we drive are roadworthy. Number one, we don't board vehicles that are overloaded. Um, there is that parameter given in the law. Let us not overspeed. Kenya's road safety record is one of the worst, with 3,200 people having been killed in road accidents in the country in 2013. At the weekend, at least 12 passengers were killed when a vehicle they were traveling in was hit by a speeding trailer. On Sunday night, five other people were killed in a collision in Manzoni area along the Nairobi-Mombasa highway. The accidents are happening even after the Kenyan government introduced tough measures to curb road carnage. Majority of Kenyans are not ready for the digital migration and do not own set-top boxes, according to a survey by Ipsos Sinovet. Annette Akisa brings us that report. Barely 15 months to the international digital migration deadline, a survey by Ipsos Innovate shows that Kenyans are not yet ready for the switch off. The survey reveals that only 41% of the respondents think the country is ready for migration. Interestingly, over 70% of Kenyans do not own set top boxes. As you see, 41% are saying yes, we are ready, while a majority, which is 59, are saying no. So a very small proportion are of the opinion that we are ready as a country for a digital migration. The cost of the set-top box was one of the main reasons given as to why most people have not been able to buy the gadgets. Among those who own TV sets, set-top boxes are mostly owned by people from the affluent population. The one-week-long survey, however, shows that 62% are planning to buy the boxes in the near future, while 23% say they have no intention of buying them due to their low income. And if you look at the income bands, um, those earning less than 5,000, which is 4,999, only 19% have a set-top box. Um, if you move up the scale, those earning over 100,000, 100% of them have a set-top box. And you can, be, you can begin to see the income issue coming up in terms of a determinant as to whether somebody has a set-top box or not. The survey that involved 2,031 respondents nationwide shows that those living in urban areas seem to be more aware of the importance of migrating, boasting a percentage of 99%. However, nationally, only 79% are aware of the importance of going digital, while 21% are not aware of the need to move. Now, if you look at those who have a TV set, and are aware about the digital migration nationally, we see that 79% are aware. So if you remember my previous slide, 99% are aware in Nairobi, but nationally, 79% are aware about the need to have a set-top box, while 21% are not aware. Now, if 21% have a TV set and they own one, but they're not aware about the need to migrate or to buy a set-top box, then there's a problem. The media is set to be the greatest loser in the event of a switch-off as viewership could decline since most people watch TV for content and 67% of the people will go digital for the additional stations. Advertisers will also spread across more platforms, making local media houses who have enjoyed Monopoly for a long time lose out. Well, these survey results have come out amid a pending court case at the Court of Appeal on digital migration. For Ebru Africa TV, I am Annette Akisa in Nairobi.
The judge presiding over the murder trial of Oscar Pistorius has ruled that a pre-recorded -pa pre package of the testimony by the pathologist who carried out the autopsy on the body of the truck star's girlfriend would be made available on broadcast media. Here are the details. Judge Thokozile Masi Pahed on Monday imposed a broadcast blackout on Gat Seyman's testimony out of respect for Stinkamp's family and to prevent children from accidentally hearing its contents. But on Tuesday, she ruled that an edited version of pathologist Seyman's testimony would be permitted for broadcast after being vetted by prosecution and defense teams. My final order. Mm -hmm. I will allow the package as suggested by Mr. Ferreira. He will show it to the defense and the state and then we can take it from there. A friend of Oscar Pistorius told his murder trial that the athlete had a big love for guns. Darren Fresco said that he had been with him on two occasions when a gun had been fired in public. Oscar Pistorius is charged with the murder of his girlfriend River Camp. The killing stunned South Africa and the millions of Pistorius supporters around the world who admired the athlete as a symbol of triumph over physical adversity. If found guilty of murder, Pistorius faces at least 25 years behind bars. More than 1,000 people have protested in South Sudan's capital, Juba, accusing the UN of arming rebels. The government recently said its troops intercepted weapons in a UN convoy marked as carrying food. The UN denied the arms were destined for rebels but acknowledged it made a mistake by transporting them by road. The latest incident will increase government animosity towards the UN mission in South Sudan known as UN Miss. In January, South Sudan President Salva Kiir accused the UN of running a parallel government in his country, a charge it denied. Protesters demanded the resignation of UN South Sudan Special Representative Hilda Johnson at the rally addressed by top government officials. UN will now send a high-level team to South Sudan to carry out a joint investigation with the government into the incident. The UN acknowledged that it had breached an agreement with the government when it transported weapons by road rather than by air. Government troops intercepted the weapons in Rumbek, the capital of Lakes City, as they were being transported to Bentiu, the capital of Unity State. The weapons were for Ghanaian troops who had arrived in South Sudan to join the UN MES forces and not for rebel forces. In December, fighting broke out between troops loyal to President Salva Kiir and his sacked deputy president, Riek Mashar, forcing some 860,000 people to flee their homes. A ceasefire was agreed between the two sides towards the end of January, but they have accused each other of violating it. Peace talks hosted by Ethiopia are currently suspended and are expected to resume on the 20th of March. Libya has stopped a North Korean flagged tanker that had loaded oil from a rebel-held port after naval forces briefly exchanged fire with the rebels. But on a contradictory note, the rebel leader, Ibrahim Jathran, denied in a televised statement broadcast from a ship that he had lost control of the oil tanker. Thank you. Libyan culture minister and government spokesman Habib al-Aman said the authorities were in control of the vessels which were halted after rebels exchanged fire with naval forces. They tried two hours ago to start clashes and fire towards our naval forces. We responded to these and they stopped. The ship is now completely secured by the Navy and we expect at any moment that it will be able to leave. The conflict over oil wealth is increasing fears that the OPEC producer may slide deeper into chaos or even splinter as the fragile government fails to rein in dozens of militia that helped oust Muammar Gaddafi in 2011 but now defy state authority. The rebels who have seized three ports and partly control the fourth port are said to have dispatched forces to central Libya to deal with any government attack. Libyan officials said the government will assemble forces to liberate all occupied ports, raising the stakes over a blockade that has cut off vital oil revenue. The rebels, made up of oil security guards, said they had sent forces by land and sea to central Libya to confront any government attackers. 
Ethiopia is enjoying rapid economic growth, outperforming many other African countries. The capital of Addis Ababa has become a huge construction site with vast numbers of new commercial buildings growing up across the city. Addis Ababa is changing and changing fast. Experts say that the boom is driving the country's strong economic performance and shows little sign of slowing down. This has caused private investors to jump on a bandwagon, putting their money into a new mixed-use building like this one. And the government, too, is investing billions of dollars in major projects, like new roads, railways and power lines, to lay solid foundation for the country's economic development. The basic engine blocks of economic transformation are the infrastructure. The Achilles heel of Africa, if you've seen, is power, lack of power, lack of road networks, lack, lack of the basic needs that you need to transform the economy. Government figures show Ethiopia's economy is growing at an annual rate of almost 10%, although the International Monetary Fund says it's closer to 7%. State-led initiatives such as tax breaks and ready access to land are fueling the construction boom. With the financial service industry still in its infancy, private investors have few other places to put their money. This is uh, the most attractive investment opportunity in the country for the time being. Since uh, uh, we do not have a, a financial market uh, that is uh, working properly. Most of the new buildings are hotels, apartments and offices. The majority built by Ethiopian construction farms plowing money back into the local community. I hire a lot of workers here. Uh, I use a lot of local materials, I use a lot of subcontractors and because of that all we to grow together and the country benefit too actually. The signs are the country is benefiting. Ethiopia has created more than 4 million new jobs in the last three years but more needs to be done to build a diverse and stable economy. Unemployment in cities dropped to 17.5% in 2012, according to the International Monetary Fund. With more people arriving every day from rural areas, the construction boom alone might not hold the answers for Ethiopia's straining economy. A new report by Save the Children indicates that nearly 10,000 young lives have been lost in Syria, not just from bullets and bombs, but from saddening lack of basic medical care in the country. Children await treatment in a hospital in Aleppo. They are the lucky ones. Tens of thousands have died in Syria's three-year-old civil war. Save the Children fears that number will only go higher as fighting continues to hinder medical care. The charity's report on medical care and children in Syria paints a dire picture of the country's collapsing health care system. Newborns have frozen to death in hospital incubators. Doctors have amputated limbs to stop patients from bleeding to death. And more. Roger Hearns of Save the Children. There's been a complete collapse of much of the health system inside Syria. Um, we're seeing situations, for example, in Aleppo, um, where 36 doctors are looking after around 2.5 million patients um, across the city. So a, a system that's collapsed, 60% of health facilities have been damaged or destroyed. And as a result of that, we're seeing some really terrible outcomes for children. Millions have fled the violence many finding refuge in camps in Jordan. It may not be home, but it offers relief for children who have known nothing but war. And with that, we come to the end of the Bulletin on Africa this morning. Join us shortly as we take a look at the leading stories on the social media platform on our segment on Trend.